Hey everybody, welcome to week three. So for this week, we are going to cover Enterobacteriaceae. This is going to be a very big chapter um, for bacteria. So just take a note that um, of most of the clinically significant gram-negative rods are gonna come out of this chapter. So you will see a ton of this in the micro world. So we were gonna get started here with our slideshow. Let me set that up, okay. All right, so basically, I hope you can't see this little recorder thing. I just have to keep moving it. It's kind of in the way and I don't know what to do with it here. Put it down there. Okay, so Enterobacteriaceae characteristics. What it means to fit into a, what we call the Enterobacteriaceae group. You must meet these five characteristics in order to be considered part of this group. You should be gram negative and be more specifically, they are gram negative bacilli or gram neg rods. So all of them are gram neg rods. They all ferment glucose. They are all oxidase negative. Most of this group will reduce nitrates to nitrites, and most of this group are catalase positive. So those are the five characteristics in order to be considered part of the Enterobacteriaceae group. For mode of transmission, um, when you think of the name Enterobacteriaceae, medical terminology will tell you that entero means intestine. So a lot of these that are in this group do inhabit your intestinal tract, and they can also inhabit the intestinal tract of animals as well. They're found throughout environments too, so not just the intestines, but it helps when you know that NRL kind of usually refers to intestinal tract area. They can colonize humans, and then contaminated food is going to be big with a few of these for food poisoning type things. Just one note, there is kind of a special one here, Yersinia pestis. That one is specifically transmitted typically by fleas is the vector for Yersinia pestis. You think of pestis as pests. They're coming from fleas off of an animal. Okay, so here are some very common Enterobacteriaceae organisms. E. coli, I think we've all heard of E. coli by now, so he's probably our biggest one that we know of. He's definitely part of this group. Proteus, Shigella, Salmonella, those are common ones that we hear of. Citrobacter, Yersinia, Edwardsiella, and Seracea. All of these are very commonly seen in the micro world. Um, definitely ones that we need to know about. Now there are others that aren't listed here, There's, but these are some of the more common ones out of this group. So we're gonna start with E. coli since he is probably the most commonly seen out of the group. He, again, inhabits your bowels or your intestines normally, but there are strains that are known to cause disease. So yes, there are some good things to E. coli. We want them a part of us in some ways, but there, when you pick up different strains of E. coli that can be linked to disease, that's when it causes a problem. E. coli does come with quite a few virulence factors to help them have different strains that can cause disease. So there are the strains listed there. There are four of them listed. There are more than four in the book, but I've only concentrated on these four for you to know at this point. So we need to remember that the enterotoxigenic strain of E. coli causes traveler's diarrhea. So I always just think of the T and toxigenic for the T and travelers. Um, traveler's diarrhea is basically like when you go to, say you take a trip to Mexico, you know how they always say don't drink the water? That could result in traveler's diarrhea, so like contaminated water. Um, so that's why you try to drink bottled water there. So that would be a great example of traveler's diarrhea. Sometimes you hear it nicknamed uh, Montezuma's Revenge, if you've ever heard that, it kind of is the nickname for traveler's diarrhea. Enteroinvasive just results in a dysentery, so again, nasty diarrhea. Enterohemorrhagic is our big bad boy out of the bunch. This is E. coli 0157, um, so it's a serotype, a special serotype of E. coli that has been known to very much cause hemolytic uremic syndrome, so you should have mentioned that back in hematology. That is basically a hemolytic anemia process with lots of bleeding and it will shut down your kidneys. The uremia means your kidney failure. So very much causes quite a few complications here. It is called enterohemorrhagic due to the lot of bleeding that you're gonna see in the intestinal tract. And then enteropathogenic E. coli affects more infants with diarrhea. All right, so again, E. coli 157, the guy with enterohemorrhagic. The O stands for an O antigen, and the H stands for an H antigen on the flagella. 
So this is just a stereotype. They have determined that this special stereotype of E. coli really links well with that enterohemorrhagic Huss case. On to Shigella. Shigella has different groups, group A through D, that you need to be aware of. Group A is Shigella dysenteriae. So again, dysentery is what it causes, and this is a big cause of different dysentery epidemics. Um, just so you remember, Shigella does come a lot with food poisoning. You might hear about Shigella quite a bit for food poisoning cases that can result in causing dysentery or diarrhea or something like that. Group B is called Shigella flexneri. That's probably the one that's seen most commonly worldwide. Group C is Shigella boidei, and group D is Shigella stonii. We see the most out of Shigella stonii in the developed world, so more first world countries. If you're going to consider the entire world, including all different levels of countries, then that's flexneri. But as far as like the United States goes, it's Shigella stonia that tends to be a little bit more common here. But those are the four groups, again, well linked with diarrhea, dysentery, food poisoning type stuff. Now, the important thing at the bottom there that's in bold is Shigella can produce a capsule. So when they try to go stereotype, because they love um, basically, whenever you get certain things like Shigella, you have to send them off to your State Department of Health or wherever the biggest place that goes to for reference lab. And they stereotype what strain is specifically growing because that's how they track if there's certain strains linked with food poisoning cases. Like, you know, when you hear of the news, oh, such and such peanut butter had to be pulled or such and such lettuce had to be pulled. That's because they had enough cases come in and they were able to stereotype and figure out what strain and then upon interviewing, because they do interview these patients, what did you eat? Where did you get it from? You know, what, you know, that kind of stuff. They figure out what's the common thread here causing the outbreak. And then that's when you hear in the news, oh, this has been, you know, pulled from the shelves. It's known to cause food poisoning or whatever. So that's what they're doing. So they want to stereotype to figure out where this outbreak is and what it's linked with. And so just to note that because Shigella can produce a capsule, you might need to heat it up to be able to stereotype it first to get break through that capsule kind of deal. All right, salmonella, again, same pretty much premise as Shigella, your diarrhea, gastroenteritis, a lot of food poisoning cases here. Some big ones that are seen in the United States is salmonella typhimurium and salmonella enteritis. Now, there's other things that salmonella can cause. Um, one is typhoid fever, which is just like a enteric or intestinal type situation fever. And that is salmonella typhi that's really responsible for that. Typhi, typhoid kind of goes together. Again, we can stereotype salmonella to kind of figure out what strains or the big bad boys at the time of causing an outbreak or whatever it might be. So you can use antisera to kind of stereotype different A through E antigens. Um, you can use a VI stereotype, you can use um, a VI anti-serum, I should say, that will target for a key antigen, specifically for salmonella type, if we're thinking it's the typhi salmonella. So I don't need you to know a ton on stereotyping, that's a more specialized micro lab, but it's just to note that we do extra work if we ever get salmonella or shigella in the lab being reported then they usually want to stereotype it too. So if your lab doesn't do that, you typically send it out. Yersinia, again, I mentioned in the beginning, Yersinia pestis is passed by fleas off of animals. This is the guy that was responsible back, back, back in the day for the plague. So he is responsible for the bubonic and pneumonic plague. Now, that plague is still around, but just not in the way that we think of it. We think of the plague um, basically, what they did is they infected like bodies and then tossed them over the wall and infected tons of people, mass panic, mass disease. Well, there is still ability to have your pestis because we still have infected animals, specifically prairie dogs especially or other rodents. And so if you pick up the fleas off them and they bite you and you get it from that or handling the infected animal yourself, you can still pick up the plague. It's just not causing the huge epidemic like it did when they used it as part of war or whatever. They used to use Yersinia pestis as very much a war weapon. And then Yersinia enterocolitica, it causes just what it's called, enterocolitis, so lots of intestinal stuff there. Um, Proteus. Proteus is very commonly seen with UTIs, just like a lot of these. You can see E. coli is your number one cause of UTIs. 
Um, but Proteus definitely is commonly seen with urinary tract infections. And it has two main species here. We have Proteus mirabilis and Proteus vulgaris. They can be differentiated based on their indole results. Proteus mirabilis is known as indole negative, and Proteus vulgaris is known as indole positive. So keep that in mind later on. Proteus is really neat, and I think we talk about this in a few slides, in the way it looks on auger. So it's going to be really neat for you guys to see it growing in the lab on auger. Um, I think I have a picture coming up, so I'm going to wait on that for a minute. All right, so what we grow these out on, basically, we are looking at blood agar because blood agar grows everything pretty much. And so all of these will pretty much grow on blood agar. McConkie agar, remember, McConkie agar specifically grows gram negatives. So if we're looking for a gram neg rod or any of these are all gram neg rods, McConkie is a great choice. We also have a lot of different selective media that you may use depending on what you think is present. Again, hecto and enteric, that HE and that XLD agar are both specifically used to look for salmonella and shigella. So if you have somebody coming in with diarrhea, well, salmonella and shigella are two big ones that cause diarrhea from food poisoning. You might want to set up one of these plates. Or there is a specific plate just called salmonella shigella agar. So any of those first three there will look and screen for salmonella and shigella specifically. If you think you might have a Yersinia enterocolitica, there is an auger called the Sin auger that is used to grow that. Yersinia enterocolitica will actually look like bullseyes on the Sin auger. So kind of like that target symbol for the target store, like a bullseye look, is how Yersinia enterocolitica will look. And then there is a specialized form of McConkie auger called McConkie sorbitol. And this is really used to differentiate when you have E. coli O N57 from just normal, regular E. coli or other E. coli in general. So again, E. coli, ON57, it was that big bad boy. And so if we really want to screen people coming in with severe diarrhea for this, we could set up to a max sorbitol plate and that will help differentiate E. coli, ON57 from E. coli. So here's that max sorbitol. When E. coli, ON57 grows on it, it will have clear colonies. So the arrow is showing you the clear colony. Whereas regular E. coli has like the purple looking colonies. So that's how you can quickly look at it and tell, oh, I have clear colonies here. Let me work up the clear ones. Those might be 0157. And the, basically the premise behind this is, is that E. coli 0157 is not a fermenter of sorbitol, so it will remain clear. Whereas normal other strains of E. coli does ferment sorbitol, so they'll change the color. Um, so yeah, just be aware of that. Incubation, pretty much 35 to 37 degrees Celsius, 24 hours at least before you read it, kind of normal. Just to note, Yersinia does tend to be picky, likes room temp, but if you don't know you have Yersinia and you still put it in the incubator, it will grow. It's just saying if you, you really are suspecting it, maybe throw a plate on the, on the room temp as well because it tends to grow there. Okay, so getting into colony appearance, um, typically gram-negative rods are very much larger colonies. They're gray in color, smooth, so they all kind of look very similar to each other. Now, there are some specific details or characteristics of a few here that I want to make sure you know. Klebsiella and Enterobacter, I didn't um, talk about these yet. I should have listed them. They're common ones that you see in the lab as well. I didn't list them on our overall common organisms, but they're definitely part of this group of Enterobacteriaceae, and you will definitely see them. I saw Klebsiella a lot when I was in the micro lab. Um, the neat thing about these is, is that they are very, very mucousy, mucoid, we call them. They have like this polysaccharide capsule that helps make them this really mucus look. They basically look like snot on a plate, like somebody snotted on a plate. It's doesn't sound pleasing, but it's very unique because when you look at it, you're right away instinctively, once you get used to seeing how they look, you're right away thinking, oh my God, that's close the other enterobacter. I know what that looks like. You know, you already kind of have an idea in mind. Of course, we test it, but you already are kind of like, oh, I think I might know what this is. E. coli definitely has a beta hemolysis most of the time. Now, there's always, you know, exceptions, but most of the time, they're large gray beta hemolytic colonies. And then Proteus is the one that I mentioned earlier, has a really unique look. It has what we call a swarming appearance. It's a very modal bacteria, and it makes a swarming appearance. It's kind of like 
waves on a beach look to it. And so I'm going to come back to this. Hold on. Right here on the left side, that's Proteus. Do you see the swarm or waves on a beach that I called it? And so it very unique. Nothing else does this except Proteus. So right away, the minute you look at it, you're like, oh, I have Proteus here. The problem becomes if it takes over the whole plate. So you have no idea if there's anything else there because it just covers everything. So it's a little tricky sometimes like that in case there might be something else present that you wanted to be aware of. So um, just note that it can do that and co cover other things up. But very unique and it's, it's very, I mean, bacteria in general are stinky. Don't get me wrong, they have a smell. But Proteus has a very unique smell. Like I always come walk in and be like, oh, Proteus is growing. Oh my God, I smell it. You know, it just has a smell. I don't, I can't even describe it. It just stands out to me. Maybe I'm the only one. All right, back to the slide I skipped. Here's E. coli. Um, right, I hope you can see my mouse, but right here, the upper left one shows the beta hemolysis on a blood auger plate. Remember, when things grow on McConkie, because McConkie is a great plate to use to grow gram negatives, let's remember back to when we first learned about McConkie. They will have, McConkie, we remember, was selective because it only grew gram negatives and differential. And remember, the differential came in as far as whether things are lactose or non lactose fermenters. E. coli is definitely a lactose fermenter, meaning that it will have purpley or pink colored colonies when it grows a McConkie auger. Anything that's considered non-lactose fermenters are clear colonies. So E. coli, definite lactose fermenters that'll appear pink or purple when it grows. If your lab uses E. and B. auger instead of McConkie, this is, it grows in gram negatives too, so you can use E. and B. E. coli will grow as green metallic sheen on there instead. Just to know, I think um, most, I want to say most places seem to use McConkie from my experience of being around and visiting labs and working in labs and that kind of thing, but, <coughs> excuse me, you will run into labs that use EMB and just know it's not the same coloring kind of process there. All right, the right side here, <coughs> excuse me. The right side is showing you that mucoid look of Klebsiella and Herobacter would also look like this. Like I said, it looks like it's not on a plate. It's really wet looking. <laughs> as far as Yersinia goes, Yersinia pestis has kind of this cauliflower look to it, especially at 48 hours. At 24 hours, it's still pretty small. And then, like I mentioned earlier, Yersinia enterocritica has that bullseye colony appearance on thin auger. So here's the sin auger, and you can see the up-close look on the right of the bullseye appearance that it gets. It's harder to see from the, on the left, the right one shows you nice and clear. Okay, so testing-wise, we learned last quarter, you know, with our gram positives, there was definitely a flow chart system. There is to that effect with gram negatives. Um, the very first test that we always run with gram negatives the minute we gram stain, we see we have gram negrod, we actually run an oxidase test first. That's not mentioned on this slide, but oxidase is the very first test we run. And basically, if it's oxidase positive, there's a bunch of bacteria that we haven't learned yet that could be under that. If it's oxidase negative, it's one of the, it could be one of the enterobacteriaceae. So oxidase is run first to determine if we have other gram negs or if we have an enterobacteriaceae. And remember, Enterobacteriaceae is a huge group of gram neg rods that are all very clinically significant and found commonly in the lab. So the minute we see it's oxidase negative, we're already starting to think about the Enterobacteriaceae group of bacteria. The next test that we run, if it's oxidase negative, to determine which Enterobacteriaceae it might be is a panel called the Invic panel. And so they consist of four tests, indole, methyl red, Vogue Proscar, and citrate. The little tiny I is just there for pronunciation purposes. It's just to help you say Umvik. Um, but again, we run this next because we have so many different enterobacteriaceae, we need to begin to separate, okay, it might be this one or it might be that one. Or, so we use this panel to help us differentiate which enterobacteriaceae might be present. So here's like how it would look on some of these test results. So as you can see there at the top line, E. coli, very much positive for indole. That's actually a huge test result of E. coli. Positive for methyl red, but negative for Vogue Proscar and negative for citrate. Same with Edwards, Cialis Tarda, and Proteus vulgaris. 
If you look at Klebsiella pneumoniae, it's different, and then Klebsiella oxytoca is different yet. So you can see how these start to separate them down and whittle it down what might be happening here. So I do need you to get to know some of these test results, especially for E. coli, the Proteus, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, and Serratia especially. Now all of them are important, but I, I can't have you memorize everything in the world, so we're just going to pinpoint those. Other tests that were traditionally used that aren't as used now in the real labs, in the real clinic labs, but we still use them in education, they still might be asked on your board's exam, are tubed augers. So these are actually glass tubes, and they're called TSI auger and LIA auger. So because your boards could still reference them, we still talk and teach about them. Plus, they're great in helping us tell what bacteria might be there. So like I said, in today's labs, we are using analyzers, and on the analyzers, we're throwing on what we call identification panels that have all these different tests in it, and they're reading all the different reactions and then coming up with what it is. Plus, we can use serotyping, and now the biggest thing that's coming is molecular that's already been happening. All right, so LIA, here's a little information on this. It stands for lysine iron auger. Um, basically, like I said, it's in a glass tube, and it's kind of like this, you know what auger looks like off a plate, but it's stuck into the tube instead. It has a slant at the top. And so we're looking for color change. So we will basically, you know, put your bacteria, you know, poke it down into the auger and then streak along the slant, incubate the auger, just like you incubate an auger plate, we're going to incubate the tube auger. And then the next day, we're looking at the color reaction to determine what has happened. So with lysine iron auger, if the organism is a known glucose fermenter, the very bottom, or what we call the butt of the auger tube, becomes acidic or yellow in color. If the organism produces an enzyme called lysine decarboxylate, then the butt becomes purple. If they produce H2S, they will have a black precipitation in the auger. So we use the initials A for acid, meaning it was a yellow color, and K for alkali, meaning it was a purple color. So if you have a reaction of K over K, which means the entire tube of auger basically was purple, both on the top and the bottom, that means it did have lysine decarboxylase enzyme, but it did not ferment glucose. If it's K over A, it means it did ferment glucose. So I think you get to play with these in the lab, so hopefully by playing with them and being hands-on, that will help you get to understand these even better by seeing the reactions. Now for triple sugar iron auger, which is the TSI, again, glass tube, this one has 10 parts lactose to 10 parts sucrose to one part glucose. So we're looking for organisms that can ferment one of these, all of these, two, you know, that kind of thing. And so if your glucose is the only one fermented, the entire thing will become yellow. If you have, again, um, a stress production, you might see black precipitate throughout. Sometimes you can have gas production, which is the CO2, or you might have bubbles or cracks. You can also have gas production in the LIA, just so you know. Again, so if it's K over A, if the whole thing stays like a purpley, I think it's red, purpley red look, like say it stays the same color it first started as, that means that that organism does not ferment sugars at all. It's non-fermenter of all those sugars. If it's K over A, only the bottom part was yellow, then it only fermented glucose. If it's A over A, the entire thing becomes yellow, that means it fermented all three. All right. Here are our known H2S producers. These guys are very well known to produce that H2S black precipitate. Remember these because you can use this to your advantage on certain questions to help you. Salmonella, Proteus, Edward Ciela, and Citrobacter are very much known to produce H2S black precipitate. Okay, so when you get to the lab, I think you get to play with some of these lab tests on hands-on, like the oxidase, the indole, you will get to play with the LIA, TSI tubes, that's going to help. And you're going to start to play with these and do unknowns and things like that. Um, so you're going to get more and more familiar. The nice thing with Enterobacteriaceae, it's not so much diseases that you have to remember that are unique. Pretty much the majority of these diseases are diarrhea, UTIs, sometimes a wound infection. Um, but it kind of tends to be the same diseases over and over. Yeah, E. coli had a few different strains you had to remember, but 
otherwise, it's basically what you're needing to remember here is how to identify each one. What are the test results for E. coli? What are the test results for Klebsiella? So in your lab, you'll have another PowerPoint that you're going to go through specifically on Invic TSI again and knowing for tests, just so you know, you're going to have to know the Invic reactions and the TSI reactions. I do not test you on the LIA reactions on your exam when, this, when they come up for this chapter. But definitely you're needing to know those Invic reactions and your TSI reactions. So again, there will be a PowerPoint on the TSI giving you these TSI reactions for your lab. So you will get through this. Um, homework will help, that kind of thing. So that's it. Um, if you need anything, as always, please feel free to reach out to me at any point. Have a great week.